we were first starting out, Brother DeBose was the one who uh, recommended me to this little church that was struggling over on Dorset Road. And uh, you remember that, Brother DeBose? And uh, then after they called me, they all left. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> But we had a building, and uh, God really blessed us and all that. And uh, matter of fact... Uh, you all gave us a bunch of pews. You remember that? That was way back, man. That's almost 35, 40 years ago. And uh, so I've been really close to this church. And then uh, the Lord blessed me with a dear friend from Bible College, Steve Parks. And his wife is very gullible. She has to be gullible to marry him, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, B.R. Lakin used to say, the old-time preacher out of Indianapolis, he used to say that in a lifetime, you only make about five friends, true friends. And God has given to me that in Steve Parks. He has been my true friend through all these years. Whether he's in Wabash or whether he's here in Duluth, he's uh, been a blessing to me. Um, B.R. Lakin also used to say that how do you know what a true friend is? It's like if you needed $1,000 tomorrow, that true friend would get it to you. Steve, I need 1000 bucks tomorrow. <laughs> oh, my goodness. A lot of love, not much respect, is there? There we go. One of my favorite stories comes out of some of the darkest days in American history. The Civil War was, was in full swing, and um, it was getting brutal and more bloodier by the day. Our 16th president was more and more depressed as every week he came to an intense and bloody kind of battle. He had sleepless nights worrying about what was going on with, with what was uh, in the country, and only to wake up with more death and destruction seems like it would never end to him. When would it ever stop? The burden of all this war rested squarely upon his shoulders. It was late one afternoon when President Lincoln looked at one of his aides, and he was in deep despair, and he said, you know what I need? He said, I need, I need to go to a church service. I need some place where my spirit can be lifted. Isn't that a lot of why we come to church on Sunday morning, a, a break to be able to get our lives in somewhat of a balance? And so he said to his aide, it was in the late afternoon, he said, why don't we go down to the National Presbyterian Church? I think I'd like to go there. And so they began to walk down the lane. It was in a day when presidents could walk around the capital city. And so they walked to the church by the time that they had gotten there, it was almost dark, and they slipped in the side door so that they would be uh, not obtrusive, not you know, upset the service that was going on. Mr. Lincoln sat down with his long legs. He crossed them and then took his stovepipe hat, set it on his lap, and, lap, and there he just uh, sat to enjoy the service. Pastor was just getting up to speak, and with intensity, President Lincoln listened as his soul was fed that day. After the service was over and the sermon was emptied, the people got up to leave, and President Lincoln just kind of sat there in obscurity. And that's when his aide asked him. His aide said, well, Mr. Lincoln, what did you think about the sermon? Did you think it was a good message? And the president kind of ruffled his brow, and he said, I think it was well prepared. I, I know that what he said was sincere and timely, well delivered. The points were clear. Uh, the pastor did a good job. Oh, oh, so then you liked it. You liked it. It was a good sermon. No, President Lincoln said, I think he failed. He failed? How? Why would you say such a thing? President Lincoln said, he failed because he did not ask something great of us. I thought about that story, and I thought about the opportunity that I have to stand here before you this morning and challenge you, because this is kind of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Pastors very rarely get to 
share the pulpit with their very best pastor friends because we have our own pulpits to fill. So this is kind of like a once in a lifetime bucket list kind of thing. And I thought as I was doing this that I, I needed not to fail in challenging you, challenging you to do something great for God. Not to just kind of go on down the road, not to just kind of live in obscurity, but to make something of your life and say, God, I want my life to count for your glory. Let's do that today. Let's ask God for something great. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord, we're so glad that you said in your word that without you, we can do nothing. That is certainly the truth. Nothing of any lasting value or purpose can be done without your hand upon our lives. Why would we ever, why would we ever want to face life without you? Lord, we realize that while we are here these some 70, maybe 80 years, if, if you're gracious, that our lives need to count for something, not to just move through in a shadow, but that they might stand forth as a life that makes a difference. Help us, God, to make that difference. Use your word today to encourage us to be available for your use. This is our prayer we offered in Jesus' name because we believe it's consistent with his will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As most of you are sitting here this morning, most of you are faithful attenders. Uh, you've been on your journey with the Lord probably for quite a while. Maybe there's a few that are here that just started this walk with the Lord. And as you walk, you understand that life is something that you needed God to help you to to walk down that journey. But generally speaking, there's a clientele this morning of brothers and sisters who have a heart for God. I think that I speak for most that when I talk to you about doing something great for God, that very rarely do we think that we're going to have such an impact. We've been taught to do the little things, and rightfully so, we should do them. We've been faithful in our service, why we even have memorized 1 Corinthians 4, verse 2, which says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found, what? Faithful. That's what God asks, and many of us are right on line with that. I applaud you for that. To do the work behind the scenes without notoriety or acclaim is the essence, I believe, of Christian charity. There's everything right about doing that. And yet, when most folks think about doing something great for God, they think about standing out front. They think about being a leader. They think about carrying the torch, certainly not in the shadows or standing uh, out front, but maybe never behind, you know, a leader. Being a leader is the last place that, that maybe you could think of yourself, let alone thinking that you are able to do something great. Most of us retreat. We would acquiesce to be found to do the little things in life. Once again, I commend you for doing those. There's a wonderful part of that. But may I warn you that God does not want us to settle for mediocrity in our life. That's a quite different picture, isn't it? When you look at the example that I'm going to give you from Scripture this morning about somebody who did something great, the person that I have in mind is probably one that will surprise you because he never thought of himself that at this time in his life that he would ever be anybody great for God. He's an 80-year-old Bedouin man. He's a guy who's out in the desert. He's under the burning sun of the Median Desert, tending sheep in the shadow of a mountain called Sinai. And there, this man, Moses by name, his name means water because he was drawn out of the Nile River. You remember that story. But at this time in his life, his life is anything but an oasis. He stands beside a flock of sheep. The sheep are not even his sheep. They're his father-in-law, Jethro's. And for 40 years, he's lived a humiliating life 
He's worked for his wife's father, his wife, Sephora, got him this job. And for 40 years, for 40 years, his life has consisted of sitting on a hillside and watching sheep. How boring could that be? You could not get farther from greatness by any other person in the world than where Moses was sitting on that morning. Once again, he's 80 years old. Now, in those days, a man might live to even be 120, so he's at least a senior citizen. Any, any senior citizens here this morning? Yeah, that's us. And uh, most of us say he's round and third, heading for home at the very least. Uh, He's, he's looking for retirement, not for a new career path. You know what I'm saying? He's ready to walk into the sunset, not into the lime life. This guy is ready to sit down. He's ready to take it easy. Moses saw himself as being finished. He has washed out his life. There's nothing there. He left to Egypt a lifetime ago as a fugitive. He had a criminal record. He was a murderer. He was a wanted man. Like many, Moses had taken things into his own hands. You ever done that? I'm going to fix this, and you take it into your own hands, and Moses had made a mess of it. And so he retreats to the backside of the desert. It took him some time, but you know what? Moses had plenty of that. He met his wife, he had children. Settled down to be forgotten for the rest of his life. All that, all that opportunity in his earlier life wasted. Now, I don't know where you are in your life. I know that many times churches are made up of kind of the same people with different faces. We all somehow make a body together, don't we? I, I'm not exactly where you're at in your walk with the Lord, but we can all relate to most of these feelings that Moses has. Many of us have made a mess of our lives. Certainly at some time or another, we've had to face the issue. Maybe your life has been checkered, or at least it's been, you've struggled to keep up with those around you because life has always been very difficult for you. Moses was in a bad predicament, and the best thing that he thought that he could do after all that was just to simply hide out, to lay low. Like us, he had no visions of grandeur. Moses was a broken man. I want to pass on four mistakes that many times broken people make, and after that, I want to address what God said to Moses and what he's going to say to us today. I think that's very important. And then we'll take a journey through his battle on the burning bush, and I'll wrap it up by giving you a couple thoughts, and, and maybe it'll help us to think about what it would mean for you to be great for God. The Bible says that we have three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Most of us, by the time our flesh gets done with us, the devil in the world doesn't have much to do with us because we, do, do, we sabotage our own lives, don't we? And, and make, no, make no doubt that, that the devil's one tough hombre, and he'd love to destroy your life, not just to give you a bad Monday, but he wants to destroy your life in the world. Why, its agenda, agenda is nothing to be trifled with. Our world has gone stupid lately. Anybody say amen to that? <laughs> But most of us have made a mess of our lives a long time ago. And, and as broken people, there are a couple of things that seem to show, show up. When we fail, we make mistakes. And the mistakes of a broken heart person, first of all, are simply to run to escape. Run to escape instead of making it right. We avoid taking responsibility, thinking that, thinking that those that by evading our troubles, it'll all go away. It'll all somehow work out in the end. How many times in our lives have we been to those that we think that we could just bury our own troubles in the sand and that the situation oh, will get better, but it only gets worse, never better. What we've done is embarrassing. It's also humiliating. We've all been down that trail sometime in our life before. 
You know, King David had his shares of of failures. You, You know that, don't you? King David had messed up in a great way, and yet God calls him a man after his own heart. How could God ever do that? Scripture says that he was a womanizer, that he was a liar, that he was a murderer. How could the Bible give him such a magnanimous title to such a terrible man? And I'll tell you that the answer is very simple. David didn't run from his sin. He came clean with God. That's the whole impetus of what David was saying in Psalm 51. He said, have mercy on me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me against thee. Thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. First thing we as broken people do is we run from our failures. And then our tendency is to secondly retreat to obscurity. That's what Moses did. Many a Christian has fallen into sin. And while it's a personality thing that brings great distress in their life, it also leaves us feeling like a spiritual disaster. I'm too bad. God, how could you ever use me? And you know what? You could never be farther from the truth. Our great God is a God of a second chance. Would anybody say praise the Lord to that? We have the tendency to run into the shadows instead of into the sunlight of God's forgiveness. We say, God, just leave me alone and I'll leave you alone. And maybe we'll get back together one day. Only for most, that day never comes. We run to our, we we escape our failures, we retreat to obscurity, and thirdly, we regret our past. Broken people live in the past. We've wasted our lives in the shame of our past. Folks, we need to get over all the regrets that we have in life. You might say, I don't have any regrets. And you probably lie about other stuff too. (laughs) Because we all have regrets. Amen? We do. How many of y'all, let's just us here this morning. How many of y'all have ever done something stupid? Would you raise your hand? Just, yeah. How many have ever done something really, really stupid several times? Yeah. That's, the, that's our nature as human beings. We do crazy things sometimes. Paul told us in Philippians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, that he was far from perfect. And then he said these words, This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Forget about it. Forget about yesterday. It's old news. Whether it's good or whether it's bad, sometimes you want to live on your laurels. Yesterday is gone. Forget about it. Especially if they're bad, don't rest in the the troubles of yesterday. That leads us to our final act of a broken person. We resist coming back to God. We struggle to make it right when God calls If you're a believer and you do wrong, God lives within you, doesn't he? And his spirit talks to you and says, let's get this right. We harden our hearts to him and life gets harder, not easier. When When we fail, it becomes one of the hardest times in our lives to make it right. Yet how many of you know what it's like to actually do make it right and to have something happen to you to where you come clean with God. How many know what that great feeling feels like? Isn't that a wonderful thing to come back to the Lord? You know, when God formed you, he knew that you would fall, that you would fail, that you would sin. And he has a plan for your life that even includes your failures. Sometimes it is in your failures that you become the greatest tool that God can use. Isn't that amazing that God would do that? God is going to use you in spite of you. 
I plead with you to be honest in your relationship with God because God wants to make you great. He wants to make you a choice example of his grace like he did with Moses. Well, let's talk about Moses for a second. Moses was in it for the time of his life. He didn't know it when he was sitting on that sand that day. He was out in the hot sand, and then a bush started burning right out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, he's got nothing going on, just a couple of sheep here, and, and this bush starts burning. Well, what does he do? It catches his eye. Why is that, why is that burning that is there? Then it wouldn't stop burning. It's not like it went out. He kind of looked back at it a few minutes. It's still burning. What's going on with this? It wasn't being consumed. Moses responds in verse 3 of Exodus chapter 3. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight with why the bush is not burnt. If he was from Arkansas, he'd say, Shazam, look at that, you know? Holy smokes. What's going on here? I can't believe this. Now, you have to understand that Moses has never read Exodus chapter 3 yet. He doesn't know about what's to happen. He doesn't know that God's in the bush, all right? He's just going, this is very weird. What is going on here? Verse 4, And when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. Moses has no idea that God is going to give him a task that is going to be so great that he will need him to accomplish it. Forty years in the making. Think about this. We have really no idea of Moses' spiritual condition when he's out in the wilderness. We, we always say the, Mo, the word name Moses, and we're going, wow, he's got to be a very, very spiritual person. We don't know that right here. We assume he's a spiritual giant. He was born into a family of privilege, if you please, as he was adopted by Pharaoh and his daughter, groomed to be the prime minister of the greatest country in the world, Egypt. Well, that was before it all fell apart. I imagine he grew, grew up looking like Charlton Heston. <laughs> How many know who Charlton Heston was? Young people, look at all those old people right there. They had all their hands up right there. No, he wasn't Charlton Heston. He probably thought of himself more like Pee Wee Herman, you know, like that. I don't think he was Pee Wee Herman either. In the New Testament, Stephen, that great first martyr, tells us that he was a man of mighty words and deeds. Probably had a chest full of medals, probably a great warrior. He was supremely significant to Pharaoh. I'm certain that Pharaoh had his eye on him for his replacement. Again, once again, until he blew it. But now he's 80 years old. Nothing but memories of those days and their fading. And then he hears out of this bush, Moses. Moses. In the Hebrew, it's Moshe. Moshe, it almost sounds eerie. Can you hear that coming out of the bush? Moshe. Then Moses responds, Hinani, I am here. You don't even have to move your lips to say those words. Hinani, I am here. He goes on and he said, God said, Draw not nigh thither. Put the, pull off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Moses can hardly stand it. God, you haven't forgotten me. Sometimes we think that when we walk to the backside of the desert, that God forgets about you, that he doesn't know that you're there. God, you haven't forgotten about me. 
He kneels there in the sand, takes off his shoes. Can you imagine how hot the sand is? Can you feel it? Forty years of silence. He covers his face. He's afraid to meet with God. I propose to you this morning that we all have kind of a burning bush mentality. Maybe not weird like that in the sense where something supernatural happens in that sense. But, but you know what I mean when, you, when I'm saying that God speaks to you. It's in a quiet kind of way. It's in a something that happened kind of way. A, a child was born or a death happened and there was something that got your attention and God spoke to your heart and I'm not sure what it was in that kind of very change that happened in your life, but most of the time as it is in my life, it's like, stop doing that. Did you, you ever have God's spirit say that to you? Stop doing that. You know better than that. Because sometimes God says that to you. But then sometimes God will say, I got this. Trust me. This is going to work out. What you need to say is, Hinani, I am here. Did the Lord ask something great of Moses? Boy, did he. I want to cut to the chase. It's in verse 10. He says, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee to Pharaoh, and that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. God says, Go, I'm, I'm sending you. You, Moses, I'm sending you to Pharaoh. And Moses, I want you to tell them, Let my people go. Well, Moses didn't want to have anything to do with it. Remember? Remember? We run to escape the things instead of making them right. We retreat into obscurity. We're comfortable in the regrets of the past. And then many times we also, fourthly, resist coming back to God. God, I can't go back to Egypt. Why, my picture's still up on the post office wall. I'm a wanted man. Nobody likes me there. They all hate me. You see... All this time has passed, and Moses had had years to relive every failure that he's ever had. Are you doing that this morning? Are you reliving some failure that you've had in your life? Confess it. Move on. Leave it in the past. The first words that Moses heard out of the bush was, Go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh. I wonder how many of us are stuck like Moses for the last 40 years, Moses has been, uh, you know, his vocabulary has really dwindled. All he's ever heard was, ba 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 out in the middle of the desert. He, he finally says to God, God, I, I can't do this. I can't speak. Sometimes we get stuck in our lives, too. We get lost in a mud bog in St. Louis instead of where God wants us to be doing something for him. Lord, I don't want to do it, he says. That's what he's really saying when he's saying, I can't speak. And God's saying, I don't care if you want to do it or not. I want you to go and ask my people to follow you, and I want you to say yes. That's a very important word in our lives. Would you practice it with me? Would you say yes? Yes. That didn't even hurt, did it? Yes. You know what? Most of the people don't read the end of the story. Exodus chapter 4, verse 29. And Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spake spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses and did all the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. They believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that He had looked upon their affliction. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped. I can't help but think that it's been quite a while since they'd worshipped God. How many of y'all know this, that most of life doesn't make sense until you get toward the end of your life? 
is that not the truth? You look back over your shoulder and you go, wow, look what God was doing. You can't see it today. Moses was stuck in the past, but he couldn't get back past today either. I'm going to ask you this morning to do something that's great. I'm going to ask you to say yes to serving God. I'm going to ask you to say no to not pleasing every attitude and every kind of need that you have, but to look to others. The Bible says that we ought to esteem others better than ourselves to serve God. I'm asking you to be available, to be available and leave the great part up to God. Once again, be available and leave the great part up to God. You see, your qualification for being great might be different from God's qualification. By being available and saying yes to God, God is going to use you something for his purpose that only you can do. He's placed you in a factory or in a home or in a subdivision. He's placed you in a particular position just to let you do something great for his glory. Nobody else carries the message but you. You have to say, yes, I'm available. In 1 Samuel chapter 14, there's kind of a quaint little story told about Saul and Jonathan, he had an armor bearer, and, and King Saul is in Gibeah. He's supposed to be fighting the Philistines, but Jonathan wanders down to the fighting line. There's this big kind of a, a gully between the two, and Jonathan makes his way down into the gully, and the Philistines are up there on the mountain. You've read this story, haven't you? And Jonathan says to his armor bearer, after the Philistines begin to chide him and talk, call him all kinds of names. Jonathan says to his armor bearer, is God limited to save by a few or by a many? The answer to that question is no. God can use just a little bit or God can use a great deal. And Jonathan and his armor bearer, instead of Saul and his big army, had a great battle that day. You remember how they climbed up in that, that uh, crevices and they went there and fought on that peninsula and Saul and his army will begin to look, what's going on over there? And Jonathan, his armor bearer, standing back to back, whipping these Philistines all on all sides. And finally, the army gets involved. A great victory in the day. Why? Because God many times uses the little things in life to be great. Don't say no. Don't say no. You'll regret it the rest of your life and probably the rest of eternity. If you're a believer this morning, you're really not in charge of your life. Your life is bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body, which are his. Be faithful. Be fruitful in your worship, in your service, in your growth. Be available to God is what I'm asking you to be. We are not our own. We are vessels to be filled. Vessels of honor that God wants to use. I want to close by telling you a story, and maybe you can relate to this kind of story. A, a few years ago, I was coming, flying back from Charlotte while my mom was still alive, and you know how they always bump you through places? I was bumping through Detroit, and on the way from Detroit to St. Louis, then uh, the plane no longer got off the ground that there was a massive kind of a of a just a crash inside the airplane. I thought that something was coming apart. Matter of fact, one of the bends fell open. That's how hard the... And then I smelled rubber burning, and, and I immediately knew that it was... When they had gotten off the ground, they had brought the wheels back in up underneath the plane, and something wasn't right. Something, something was broken. Well, I was trying, trying not to panic, you know, but I could see the panic in everybody else's eyes, and... This, the, the flight attendant came down the aisle not too much longer later, and I go, you know, I don't freak out about these kind of things, but I thought you ought to know about this, you know. There's a big, like, bang, you know. I, we all smelt rubber back here. And she said, yes, we heard it too. We're monitoring this, we're monitoring this situation, and it'll be all fine. You know, like, like, really? Like, that's going on, you know? Well, it's only about an hour flight from from Detroit to the Lou, and so we're getting ready to land. 
and the pilot comes on. And you know how calm the pilot voices are. He says, uh, we have a concern. <laughs> it's not like, Houston, we have a problem here, you know, like that. We have a concern, and, and we're monitoring it. We're going to be flying by the tower, and they're going to look and see if there's anything wrong. And so we flew by it, and he comes back on. It looks like there's some kind of situation going on with the right back tire in, in the plane, something along that line. And uh, so we're going to be making an emergency landing. Well, at that time, man, all the women started crying along with me, you know, and we were, <laughs> and we were going, oh, no, what's going to happen, you know? I, I looked to a couple that was sitting right next to me. I said, you know, I'm a pastor. Can I, can I help you? And they said, you know, I don't guess so, but if you had a, you know, I need a strong shot of, you know, Jack Daniels or something like that, you know, like, I don't think they got the point there, but, and so, you know, your blood pressure goes up a little bit like that. You ever have anything like that happen to you? And, and it sounded like it, I mean, I, I heard the bang. I, I knew something was wrong. Landing without wheels is generally a problem. You know what I'm saying? And, and so, to make a long story short, we crashed and I died, and that's the end of the story. No. And so, uh, we flew around for about an hour, and I called my wife on the cell phone, and the flight attendant, you're not talking to somebody on your cell phone. Oh, no, I wouldn't do that, you know, like that. And so I, I tell my wife, get at the end of the runway, take some pictures. You might make some money on my death. I don't know, you know, something like that. And, and so, you know, they, they say, well, we're going to begin the process for emergency, for the emergency landing, and we want everybody to bend over and tuck yourselves, put your, you know, go forward, and, and, and I, this couple next to me, man, they were folded right over, you know, like, I'm, I can't fold over. I just crash into the seat. And so I said, I think I'll just take some pictures, videos of what's, what it's like in a crash because I'm not going to survive this anyway if that happens, you know. And so I started doing that. And, and so we, we started coming down and got slower and slower. And you see all the emergency vehicles out on the runways and stuff. And, and so we're so, going so slow. I'm thinking, man, we're going to about stall out. And we hit the runway. And sure enough, the, a tire had, 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 was flat. And it spun us a little bit and then back and forth, kind of jerked us around. But it was pretty much all over before, before it even started. I, I thought about while we, were staying, while we were flying around, you know, kind of getting rid of all the fuel and preparing for that emergency landing. Do you ever have a time where you evaluate your life? Was, did my life count? What will my kids and my family do if I'm gone, if I'm taken out of that situation? You know, is there something that I, that I left undone that needed to happen? Could I ask you those questions this morning too? Now, I, I realize you're not crashing on a plane, and you know, I'm not saying if you walk out of here, you're going to get hit by a bus, you know, anything like that. That's not, but have you ever valued, what would people say about you? Would they say, that you were available for God to use. You know our life here, that, that quick, like a vapor, boom, gone. But eternity lasts forever. Shouldn't we make maybe a little bit more attention on what we're doing day by day? God, I'm available. You get up in the morning saying, you know, Private Gilman reporting for duty, Lord. What do you, what do you have for me today? Do you walk around with eyes Saying, God, use me, speak a word of kindness, witness to someone. Let's be available for God and make our lives great for him. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Lord, thank you for the opportunity, the privilege of speaking to my brothers and sisters this morning. This great church with a great...